I love the relationship that you and I forged together over these three years. Almost three years yeah, now I've been in Tennessee. Uh, in that uh, Jack and I scheduled him coming in, and I knew that there was a reason. Outside of talking politics and talking the presidential election and all of those things, which we will discuss. And I looked at Jack and I said, why are you here? <laughs> I was in the neighborhood. <laughs> Jack's house. I was just around. I want to I see how long your hair was by. growing. Yeah, yeah exactly. Sure. Uh, but there is a very important reason that you are here, and it uh, involves the state of Tennessee and really, by extension, the United States of America. Uh, and I want to get into that. But before I do, how's it going? It's good. It's good. Obviously, a lot of attention. We're all very intently focused on 12 days from now, mm-hmm. and rightfully so. The presidential election, the United States Senate is at stake, the uh, U.S. House of Representatives. And, oh, by the way, we have some state legislative races as well that we're watching very closely. Are any of them com- competitive? So on the Senate side, we feel very good. Uh, we are challenging uh, Heidi Campbell uh, with Wyatt Rampey. I had Wyatt Rampey yeah, on yesterday. I, 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 uh, I heard a portion of that. Wyatt is a great guy, outstanding candidate. So that's a race where we're playing offense, if you will. Uh, we do have some of our incumbents that have uh, Democratic challengers. But we feel really good uh, about about them, so we will see. And then on the on the House side, State House side, there are some some races that are pretty close. But I always have to remind myself, even in the three years that I've been here, that the House races happen every two years mm-hmm. in the state of Tennessee, which seems like a lot. Yeah, it's, but I mean, I guess, never stop running. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I guess that is that is a mirror reflection of the United States of America. Right. So yeah. I mean, it makes sense. But yeah, it's a it's a nonstop cycle for those guys. Yeah, over there. and Senate our our terms are four years, a U.S. Senate are six years. But uh, so we get a little bit of a break in between, a little half elections. and half. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, so uh, what what have you been uh, what have you been doing lately? Bell Kay and I were talking about our weekend last week. Weekend. Did you have a good weekend last weekend, Jack? I did. Uh huh. I had a I had a I had a great weekend. Did you yeah, now? I what did. what did you what, what, what did you do? What did you do? <laughs> well, gee whiz. Uh, let's see. Watch some football. Uh, and, uh, it's uh, always a, that's always a winner. That's right always there. fun, right there. And, uh, yeah. Oh, and uh, and I had five or six hundred of my closest friends over whoa, for an event. Whoa, um, whoa, whoa. Dude, not all of them could make it though, because I know you just... saw the invitation. I know you you. You so you heard the ad. It was back there a, hard. Oh, was there an invite? I, there? I was I, running advertisements on your on your show, <laughs> Matt. I mean, I bought time. I I, I bought advertising you, time. You bought on advertising time. I would have called you personally, but quite frankly, if I'd invited you personally, I'd have had to ask you to get a haircut if you were going to come. <laughs> So what the hell does that say about me? Well, that says well. Well, look he at, never said I, that he was going to invite you personally. <laughs> Well, thanks, Jack. I appreciate that. I appreciate the personal invitation. No, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm a horrible. So Pamela Fur, you, yeah. you had far more important people to be there. Well, Pamela, yeah, Pamela, Pamela Fur was there. So which means always, well, 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 as always, did an amazing uh, job singing the excuses. national anthem. Stop with your excuses. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you passed us over for a ginger, sir, and that will not be forgiven. But uh, she's she does such sing a great a, singer. She does sing she's a better, an amazing singer. She does she sing a better national anthem than we do. I mean, at least than I do, Bell. If you want to give it a go next not, year, not com- not up against Pamela, no, no. Well, you know, I mean, we forgive her for being a redhead because of her ability to sing the national anthem because it brings tears to your eyes. I hope you had a great event. Yeah, we did. We I'm did. Pick- it you, was, I, I, it I announced that I was going to pick on you. Well, and I, I deserve it. I, I really do. Uh, if you could vote for me, I'd probably have made that call. But you, you live in Wilson County. I tried to get you to move to Williamson County. But well, it's too expensive it. over oh, there. Oh, come on. You, if you'd have bought something three years ago, it probably doubled in value by now. <laughs> I, I, watched, I watched a show. Uh, my, well, uh, E watches this show called uh, Lottery Dream Home. I, it's on like HGTV. I don't know where it is. But this guy was in uh, Nashville. And she's like, oh, Nashville. And I go in, and it's in 2017. And this couple is looking at this house in Thompson Station for 320000 <laughs> It's like a four-bedroom, two-and-a-half bath house for yeah, 320000 nice Oh, it was 2017. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, if I can find anything, it, I mean, that house is probably triple in price. Oh, uh, it's no no telling. It's insane. It, it really, well, it, it's a good problem to have. It, it really is if you're a homeowner, yeah. Well, if you're already there, it's a yeah. bad problem to have if you're looking for property. Uh, so tell us, uh, tell us about the Supreme Court situation. What's going on? So you recall, you had me on your show a couple of different times to talk about this. Back in 2023, in our legislative session, we passed uh, legislation, first in the nation to pass legislation to ban transgender surgeries and uh, 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 hormone therapies and puberty blockers for minors 
uh, as a treatment for gender dysphoria, gender confusion, whatever the term might be. Uh, we had a lot, big debate about it, a lot of conversation, ultimately passed that legislation overwhelmingly, has broad support in the state of Tennessee. As expected, we were sued. Um, and over that legislation, there was a temporary injunction imposed by the federal district court. The Sixth Circuit, of course, we appealed that injunction. The Sixth Circuit came in, overturned that, and allowed our law to go into a place. So the law we passed in 2023 is the law of Tennessee right now. Those surgeries on minors and prescription of those very harmful drugs is prohibited in the state of Tennessee. Since then, numerous other states have passed various versions of, the, of that legislation. Well, <clears throat> the uh, the plaintiffs in the case appealed the Sixth Circuit decision to the United States Supreme Court. We found out several months ago that they, in fact, granted cert and would take the case up, and, in fact, our case would be the lead case, along with the law that was passed by the state of Kentucky. So very exciting. Uh, it's not often that you sponsor and pass legislation mm-hmm. as a state legislator, especially something of this significance uh, that's going to be heard before the United States Supreme Court. We heard earlier this week, I think on Monday, that oral arguments on that case will be held on December 4th. So I'm excited. I'm, I'm a little apprehensive. I feel good. If you go and read the Sixth Circuit opinion upholding our law and the rationale and refuting the claims from the plaintiffs of why they believe that the law is unconstitutional, the Sixth Circuit laid out an amazing opinion written by Judge Sutton, who's a judge on the Sixth Circuit. And uh, But, yeah, so we're going to the Supreme Court and um, um, see what they have to say about it. All right, so to catch everyone up and really to to catch myself up as I try to remember the particulars of the law. It really is just an age restricted, mm-hmm. uh, an age restriction, right? Absolutely. That, uh, that these procedures are not to be done on individuals in the state of Tennessee under a certain age. That's correct. Under the age of 18, which is the age of majority. And I recognize some people say your mind's not fully developed even at 18. But that's when we do recognize you as an adult. So it's very consistent with that. You turn 18, you want to go have body parts removed or something rebuilt. Tattoo, uh, that, whatever. That, that, exactly. You you can you can do that. But we don't believe, I don't believe, uh, and I think the majority of, vast majority of Tennesseans agree, that if you're 14, 15, 16 years old, you're going through a tough time, you're suffering from what they refer to as gender dysphoria, um, that you should be making decisions that result in irreparable damage to your body. They, this can't be undone. When you have something cut off, uh, it, that, it can't be undone. These drugs, these hormone uh, therapies and puberty blockers, they, they cause irreparable harm in the development of the human body. So we just believe, number one, we love these kids. We don't, we don't hate them. We want them to get care. We want them to get mental health treatment, get them through this difficult time. Many children who go through this, by the time they reach adulthood, they grow out of it and they're able to go on and lead normal lives in the body that God gave them. Well, and every argument that the political left primarily makes in support of these minor surgeries or these puberty blockers every single one of these arguments has been refuted mm-hmm. right they they made the argument that our position jack your position and my position leads to teenage suicides it's not true no, no. Uh, they, they make the argument that well uh there are certain things if someone has if we've determined that someone is gender dysphoric at an age under the age of 18 uh, sometimes it is very necessary to go ahead and do certain things before uh, they achieve full puberty or whatever. Well, I've read scientific journals that indicate that even if that is the case, even if I grant you that this person is legitimately gender dysphoric, the manner in which we go through gender transition needs you to go through puberty first right. in order to achieve the gender transit. I mean, if we're talking about sex change surgeries, sure, sure. you have to go through puberty in order to do the sex change surgery that these folks claim that they want these kids. So none of the arguments hold water that they're making. What are the plaintiffs saying? What did they argue before the so, Sixth Circuit? So one of their chief arguments is um, the for, under the 14th Amendment, um, equal protection, if, if you will, that we are singling out people because they are transgender. And, and that's not the case. That this law is, is equally applied to, to all minors in the state of Tennessee. We're not singling any particular group out. Whatever the reasoning is that they may want to alter their body. Mm-hmm. And so the Sixth Circuit agreed with us in, in terms of refuting that, that argument. Um, uh, they make the, the argument r- with regards to parental rights. You've known me long enough and I know you. Long. We are fierce defenders of parental rights and education and how you raise your kids and, and that type of thing. But the state does have a compelling interest to step in in certain instances, and we do it across the board. You mentioned getting a tattoo. Even if your parents want you to be able to 
to go into the 7-Eleven and buy a six pack of beer. We don't let you do that. We don't right. let you buy cigarettes. So this is very consistent with, with the law in the state of Tennessee. And another thing the Sixth Circuit laid out, which I found very compelling, is that this is new. This is that, that, this is a perfect example of where states and legislators and uh, our, our constituents, we should have a debate. The medical community should study this. But let's put the brakes on doing anything that can't be undone. That's what it always comes back to. For if, if they were going to do something that you could wake up when you're 22 and say, ah, I changed my mind. Let's get let's let's undo this. But you can't undo well, that's the removal right. of, well, of a and, body part. And age restriction and uh, age standards are I mean, they're embedded in the Constitution of the United States of America, right. indicating that our founding fathers understood that if you are uh, under 25 years of age, that you are not mature enough to serve in the House of Representatives. Sure. If you're under 30 years of age, you're not mature enough to serve in the United States Senate. So they understood uh, that that level of wisdom that comes with maturity. Secondarily, I'll give you a, a more affirmative example. Of course, you know, we don't let kids buy alcohol or consume alcohol legally, even if their parents want them to. If a parent went to the United States military and said, my 15-year-old wants to be a U.S. Marine, right. my 15-year-old is going to be, and I want him to join right now, we're, we're going to say no. That's right. I mean, That's uh, right. But, but those age restrictions are there for a generalized purpose. Does that mean that some people don't mature faster than others? Sure, but you have to have those age standards in order to have a civilized society. Another element of this that's very important to me, certainly the policy is important. It's why I sponsored this. William Lamberth, the House Majority Leader, did an amazing job in the House carrying this legislation as well, passed overwhelmingly. I believe in the policy. I believe in, in protecting kids from this. But it's also a, a, a Tenth Amendment issue. It's a state sovereignty issue. Mm -hmm. and, and, and as a state legislator, that's very important to me. And, and again, I'm grateful to the Supreme Court. I have no idea how they're going to rule. But when I read the Sixth Circuit opinion defending our law and our right to pass a law and other states that have passed similar laws, there's, uh, there's bills, different decisions. But the reason the Supreme Court has it is the Eighth Circuit rendered a different decision. I think the Eleventh Circuit, uh, the Ninth Circuit. So there are different decision so that's why the supreme court ultimately took it up but they're using my bill the one we passed here in tennessee is the test case uh can you hang around for sure. a few minutes longer sure. thursday edition of the matt murphy show continues with senator jack johnson on the air with us uh talking about legislation passed by the tennessee general assembly that is now uh going through the legal process and going up to the supreme court was this I I imagine when you passed this legislation that this was an expectation. It's certainly that it would get litigated. Yeah, definitely. And and this is a conversation we have all the time. It's part of governing. And when and when we're contemplating legislation, we're drafting legislation, we're working with our attorneys to try to address some issue or problem. It's something I think a lot of folks do. Well, just pass the bill. Pass. Well, we have to pass a bill that if we think it's going to get challenged, it's got to be defensible. So it's kind of a fairly lengthy process with the attorney general and our attorneys to make sure. If, if it's something we feel like we're going to get sued over, that it will withstand judicial scrutiny. Luckily, this bill did. And uh, you feel who will argue it? Will it be Scrimetti or I, I don't know. I don't know. It'll, it will certainly be uh, our attorney general, Jonathan Scrimetti, who's done it. And he and his team He's have done fabulous. an amazing job defending this and many other bills as well. But this one, obviously, very personal to me and many of my colleagues in the General Assembly. And they've done a, a yeoman's job defending it. And so I'm not sure who will actually stand at the lectern and, and, and address the court. But I, I'm confident it'll be someone who will do a great job. Hey, Matt. Um, w maybe we loan Jay Singh player to him because Jay's got a, a thousand percent batting record. Yeah, he does have court. a good batting average well, at the I'm U.S. Uh, Supreme. I don't know that he knows transgen transgender law in the way that he knows employment. I have law, every faith in Jay. Singh, I have a lot of faith in him too. I'm a big fan. Hear yeah. him all the time on your sure. show. Brilliant guy. Uh, will Will there be a moment of personal privilege where maybe Jack Johnson makes an appearance in the United States Supreme Court? So we did inquire. Uh, Leader Lambert and I did did inquire about the chances because you don't of, get those chances you know, very it's often. Our bill like that's yeah, being right. argued and right. so it is a big deal it's uh, and it's something I'm very passionate about um but we were told uh eh, don't get your hopes up <laughs> i think it's i think it's very difficult to get into the actual courtroom not saying it's an impossibility i will be there i, I am absolutely planning on being in washington on december 4th uh at, at, at a minimum outside on the steps of the supreme court because i want to be there for that historic moment i was in washington i, I encourage anyone that is is invested and involved in the politics of the United States of America and our government. If you get the opportunity to be in Washington, D.C., around a time where there's something big being argued, 
please do yourself a favor and go outside and just be outside yeah. of the Supreme Court. Yeah. I was in D.C. when the Kavanaugh hearings were going oh, on. Oh, wow. wow. And it is, it is insane, uh, but it is an in insane example of the liberties and freedoms Absolutely. that we believe in Absolutely. in the United States of America for people to express themselves freely and openly about things that are going on with their government. How great is it? And, and I, I do plan to be there, and I fully expect there to be a lot of people there who don't like the bill that we passed. Sure. And they will be expressing their First Amendment rights. And great. I mean, that's, that's a beautiful thing about America that we can go up. And I, I've told the story several times that early in my grassroots activist uh, political involvement long before I ever ran for office, my wife and I were protesters. We we protested the passage of a state income tax in Tennessee in 99, 2000, 2001. And now you got a commercial. You're on a I commercial know, as a result. We're talking about it and and, and, it's, it, and I'm honored that they asked me to do that. And so I was at the Capitol as a protester. Now I'm at the Capitol being protested. So it's it, and now I celebrate all of it. Come in full circle. Absolutely. As long as you do it in a you know civil manner. Uh, d speaking of Taxes And speaking of tax increase proposals, uh, Davidson County has a transit tax proposal. Does Jack Johnson have a position on this? I do not. I do not. I do not live in uh, Davidson County. I encourage folks to do the research and their homework, but I don't think it'd be appropriate probably for me to weigh in on that. I mean, uh, would would this not in some fashion, and I'm not pressing you on an answer here, but I, I'm just genuinely curious. Do you feel like this would in some way affect your your county of sure. Williamson. I mean, I, I mean, because obviously, if you're in, you know, if, if I don't necessarily believe that this will do what they say that it's going to do, but even if it did, I mean, it could potentially impact the ability to have bus transit or whatever in Williamson County. Absolutely, and, and obviously, I've got thousands of constituents who commute to Nashville every, every day, day to go to work or go mm -hmm. to school or shop or whatever the case might be. And talking about an increase in their sales tax, I've got a lot of constituents who go to Nashville and will be paying that tax increase. But it is a local government matter, and and very, I just try to be very careful about those things weighing in on something. Um, you know, if it's if it's truly a local decision, it'll be on the ballot, and the voters of Davidson County can make that decision. Well, we'll see. It, it's interesting. I mean, I'm I'm as I had Freddie O'Connell on the show with me last week. I said to him, and, and this is where I feel that a lot of politicians, in just one man's opinion, they make mistakes. That if you are upfront. And forthcoming, and I'm not saying that Jack Johnson has a comment on any of this, but if you're upfront and forthcoming about every aspect of a tax increase proposal and you allow the intelligence of the voters to weigh in and weigh the benefits versus the cost, you can get a fair vote. When you seem shady on the front end about the cost mm -hmm. of the matter or what it exactly will do and, you know, where eminent domain comes in with transit hubs in this example, I mean, that oftentimes it sets things off in the wrong fashion. I mean, I, I wasn't around for the income tax uh, proposal, uh, but didn't the governor at the time, was it Haslam? No, Don Sunquist. Uh, Don Sunquist. Did he not flip-flop on the issue? He did. He did. And um, and see, this is where it... it yeah, exactly. You he start there, it's tough. He campaigned for his first term in one of the leading... Uh, pieces of his platform and, and running for governor was no state income tax. He was elected in 94. My wife and I worked hard on his campaign as volunteers. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we're very happy he got elected, ran for re-election in 1998, maintained that position of no state income tax. And then two years into his second term, he comes out and, uh, and proposes a state income tax. So, yeah, not, not good. And, and Marsha Blackburn did lead the effort, uh, along with, uh, May Beavers and Diane Black and, and, and others, but I think uh, our own Phil Valentine was oh, a big, my gosh, a yeah, big component. That's, that. that's where, uh, uh, in fact, it was Phil Valentine broadcasting on a Saturday morning. Uh, from Legislative Plaza, they get my wife and, and me down there with our small daughter. She had just been born, and we were down there. Get down there honking uh, your horns. Honking yeah. the horns and, and protesting, yeah. Was that a part of, I'm just curious, was that a part of what ultimately led you into this side of politics and running for it accelerated service. it. Yeah, this was in 2000, I think, 2001. And we, my wife and I, you know, we met at a Young Republican event in 1992, and we were both passionate about that. Or I say, uh, my wife was passionate about politics, and I was passionate about her. And so, <laughs> but we, we, we That's both funny. shared, we both shared a, a love for it and, and just got very involved working on campaigns, knocking on doors, help trying to get, and keep in mind, this is back when Democrats controlled everything in this state. Right. We had Democratic governors, super, Democrat super majorities in the legislature, two 
two Democrats, United States senators. So we were fighting from behind. You know, we were the and uh, we'd win a race, lose a race, and slowly but surely. And then that the income tax battle it certainly accelerated my interest. And then it was, I guess, five years later that I ran. What do you think's happening in twelve days, Jen? <sighs> I think it's going to be a good day, but I, but I'm I'm I, I, I almost am hesitant to I say don't, that because I don't, I don't well, want to get my hopes I don't, up. I don't do well with this. Yeah, I don't do I well know. feeling this good this far out. Well, and you know, momentum is so critically important. We've seen times in the past where one candidate or the other really had a great deal of momentum, but it was too soon, and then they mm-hmm. kind of leveled off, and and then they started to fall back. I feel like President Trump, the momentum is with him at this time, and and let's hope it continues. And keep in mind, how 20, million, 20 30 million people have already voted, right. so that momentum, it's not just peaking on election day. It's It's got to be leading up to election day, so I, I'm cautiously optimistic that's well put I, up. I, 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 I have to continuously remind myself, you know, I'm I'm I feel like I'm relatively young. I mean, that's relative nowadays because I'm 51. But, you know, a long time I did this where everything built to Election Day and Election Day was the day. Yep. Now I, I have to reset my thinking and mm-hmm. recognize that a lot of people that I'm talking to right now have already voted. Yeah, that's right. And I don't like that system, but it's the system we have. System and what I'm have. encouraged by some of the numbers that we're seeing come back. I'm encouraged that Republicans have more embraced the system. They don't like it, and they we cannot like it, and it might not be the way that we did it 20 years ago. Absolutely. But it's the way we're doing it right now. We've got, got to play the game by the rules that are in front of us. One of the smartest things I think we did is engage in ballot harvesting. You know, four yeah. years ago, we said, that's awful. This is, you know, we can't do it. Well, if it's legal in a state, it's not legal in Tennessee, by the way. Right. You know, we do not allow ballot harvesting. We have very limited mail-in voting. I think Tennessee does elections in a very, very good manner. But in those states, that do allow it play by the rules don't play by the rules as you wish they were you got to play by the rules as they are and that includes what's the definition of ballot harvesting is going into communities and you know knocking doors and saying hey have you gotten your mail-in ballot have you filled it out if you want to fill it out i'll go ahead and take that to the mailbox for you that's, that's yeah, basically you're, you're basically hard. harvesting and 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 it's really only applicable with these heavy mail out systems and and some of these other states but democrats did it very effectively and i'm really uh, proud of president trump um uh, encouraging people to vote early i mean in some of these states it, where it could come down to one or two percentage points yes g- a, a bad storm could happen. You mm-hmm. could have a snowstorm or, uh, you know, you could have a bad weather God event you or get some, sick. something yeah. else. You get sick or your child's sick or something. Just go vote. Just go get it and bank it and get it in the system. And you're seeing that all over the country, do you including appre- here in Tennessee. Do you appreciate there are some in our audience? I mean, I, 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 Chris Hand, uh, our uh, fellow co-host on uh, on Super Talk 99.7 WT, and he and I have these conversations, and he he's younger than me. Uh, but he has concern about, well, I just, I worry about, you know, giving up, giving ne'er do wells a looky loo into the system and a looky loo into how things are going. And I understand those sure. concerns. I mean, we hear about them all the time. You're, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with them as well. Oh, absolutely. And, and we've had conversations. I have great faith and confidence in, in the people that run our elections in Tennessee. I don't think that's an issue. I think you're, if you vote early, your your ballot is secret. It is they do not look at it. They they that is that, that is a strict law. They'd be in gross violation of the law and mm-hmm. subject to a hefty prison term if they did. Uh, the the early uh, voting is counted uh, late on election day and it's released that evening. If you early vote in Tennessee, your vote is safe. It will be protected. Um, you know, I can't speak as much to other states, but I have great confidence in our system here in Tennessee. Well, I have confidence in the voters of Pennsylvania that they believe Kamala Harris when she tells them that she wants to ban fracking. Yep, they, they, they just ought to listen to her, right? Just listen to the words she has said it, repeatedly. Well, I mean, and I thought Trump said it so well several weeks ago. He was sitting at a town hall with Sean Hannity, and he said, look, and I, and I know it's in, not in his nature to say it this way, but I wish he would say it more. Uh, to people who might be on the fence is like, look, you don't have to like me. You, you don't have to appreciate the way That's that right. I do my business. Uh, but you have to vote for me. And you have to vote for me because if you work in the oil or gas industry, if you work in the, in the coal mines, she's going to kill you. Yeah. She's going to destroy she's you. She's coming after your job. Right? I mean, you can like her all you want. She's right. still going to destroy your job and destroy you your economic. You think you just fell out of a coconut tree? Uh, that's true. <laughs> we probably did fall out of a coconut tree. Uh, uh, 
Talk to me about, I mean, what do you know about East Tennessee? Uh, I, I know that you've spoken with many represent, uh, representatives over there in that area. Are we uh, are we doing okay in the aftermath of Helene? It's only been a month. It, it's It's been a month, and I, I've been up there. I toured up there with the governor a couple of weeks ago. He was nice enough to, to invite me and, and others to go up and enter the area. And, and Matt, I'm telling you, it's. I was here for the 2010 flood. Obviously, I had mm-hmm. a business that flooded. It was bad. I mean, it, it was bad uh, here in Middle Tennessee. But there in Irwin and Carter County, where we're standing on an interstate just a few yards from where an entire interstate bridge is gone, mm-hmm. it's gone. And from where we were standing on that interstate, looking down at the river, which had more or less gone back down to normal levels, and it's probably 50 feet down there from where we're standing on the interstate, and that water was 20 feet over our head. I mean, mm-hmm. the massive amount, Butch Elu's commissioner of TDOT said that the engineers said at the peak of the flooding there, there were 1.2 million gallons a second coming through that valley. And you have to be there kind of understand where you see the mountains and you can see where the water would all kind of converge down where we were standing. Niagara Falls is 700,000 gallons a oh, second. Oh, wow. Almost twice as much water as goes overnight. It was Incredible. coming through this beautiful valley there, and then the, the factories are just destroyed in the homes. Uh, it's going to be a long time. But I can tell you, as Governor Lee says this so well, we, we've seen unbelievable heartache and destruction and suffering, but we've seen unbelievable resilience and hope and uh, the spirit of Tennesseans coming out and helping neighbors. I think our uh, team of folks have, have done a great job. The local folks there have too. Never going to get everything perfect, but uh, we've responded aggressively and quickly, and we're going to be with them. We're not going to forget about this once it's not in the news anymore, because it's going to be years to rebuild over there, but we will re- rebuild. I, I've tried to make a point to talk to the people of East Tennessee. I've got a connection over near Asheville and Fairview, North Carolina. We're talking to those folks as well because you don't want to forget them. Yeah. And it's easy in the news cycle that we live in. Yeah, you move on. To move on, whatever. especially when you live in an area that hasn't been impacted. I thought Governor Lee said it really well. You know, I remember the April 27th, 2011 tornado mm-hmm. outbreak that happened all across the Southeast. Yeah. 252 people died in Alabama alone. And I long said in the aftermath of that that Alabama wasn't defined by April 27th. It was defined by the days and weeks yes. and months and years after. Very much I feel so. the same way yeah. about the state of Tennessee. I thought Governor Bill Lee said it well when a, a reporter asked him, and I'm paraphrasing, of course, you know, uh, do you feel like that t- you properly planned for this? And Governor Lee said, how do you plan for something that's never happened? That's never happened. It's, it's a once in right. a millennia right. event, once in a thousand years. Everything kind of had to so. be exactly right to get that storm, that system in place yeah. in that particular region of the world in a way where it would do what it did. Right, right. And and I w- and cuz I was standing with Governor Lee when he said that. That was at that Presseville on that interstate. He may have said it subsequently as well. Sure. But I was standing there one of the times he said that and I thought he said it said it very well. But he will tell you and I will I will confirm that that we will learn from it. And and we need to always be thinking about how uh, we can better respond to some of these events and, and, and provide the resources necessary for people to get back on their feet. So we'll continue to learn, um, but it's, it's going to be a while, but we're going to get East Tennessee back better than ever. Jack, good to talk with you as always. Best of luck at the Supreme Court level. I know we'll have multiple updates leading yep. up to the arguments happening in December. Obviously, we're rooting for a successful outcome at the Supreme Court. I know that, I know that you're confident. I'm confident as well. You know, yeah, cautiously. Cautiously yeah. confident, but confident nonetheless. And we'll have you back on. Sounds good. Thanks, come to our Come to Wilson. By the way, I'd like to extend an official invitation. <laughs> Personal? We're doing a lot Personal? of advertising. We're talking about it a lot, but you might not hear them. An official <laughs> invitation to our event out in Wilson County. I know you got a lot of things going on. I know you might swing over to Marsha's thing in Cool Springs probably, or whatever. Probably, yeah. But uh, we'll be there at the Wilson County Fairgrounds. It's going to be huge. It's I mean, going to be Huge. But isn't the VIP sold out? I mean, I, that, I, well, could you get me in? I mean, can you pull any string? Do you know anyone? I mean, could well, you? Well, the VIP. I'm not asking for anything. The free. VIP pay, is sold but, out. You know, VIP stands for very important people, <laughs> not very important politicians. <laughs> point taken. Point taken. I don't. I don't qualify. That's Come on point. out and see us. Jack. All right. Thanks. Here's Senator Jack Johnson.